Hi, this is Bobby, and today we're going to continue with our teaching series called Hades, Prison of Darkness, and this is part four. So what we want to do today is we want to do steps seven, eight, and nine, and let's just go back through this process flow of redemption from Hades. So the things in black, um, one through six, we've already talked about. So we saw that Satan fell from heaven into Hades due to his sin of wanting to be worshipped as God. So that's what led to his downfall, and that's what led him to tempt mankind into sin. He wanted to be worshipped as God. He found a way to do it. He tricked mankind to bow the knee to him, and then he became God of this world and the ruler and authority over man and over earth. And so that's how he accomplished receiving worship. And number two, Satan had authority over mankind, and not only did he rule and reign over mankind while they were alive on earth, but he would take them into prison, into Hades. Then number three, Jesus was prophesied to release all the prisoners and to save all mankind, and every prophecy must be fulfilled. Amen? All the prophecies must be fulfilled. And when you go back and read the Gospels, you'll see time and time and time again that Jesus intentionally did something so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. And then there would be a quotation. And then there would be another one like that. And another one. And another one. So Jesus was constantly doing things on purpose to fulfill prophecy. And he even had to do things that he didn't want to do because the prophecy had to be fulfilled. For example, he had to speak in parables so that the people would not understand what he was saying and they would not receive salvation. And that was heartbreaking for him because Jesus is the source of salvation. His heart is completely 100% oriented to save all mankind. And so it was painful for Jesus to do many of the things he had to do in order that the prophecy would be fulfilled. Amen? Number four is that Jesus paid for all sins for all people. And in doing so, Jesus died. Okay, Jesus died. He went to Hades. He went to the prison of darkness called Hades, called Sheol. And when he was down there, he preached to the dead because he wanted to bring them salvation. Okay, number six is Jesus. Again, he paid for the sins of all mankind and his prison sentence was three days in Hades, in darkness, for the sins of all mankind. Amen? So there's no punishment that will ever be greater than three days in Hades, three days in darkness, three days in Sheol, three days in the prison. That is the maximum penalty because Jesus paid for all sins for all mankind and the cost of all sins for all mankind was three days in Hades and darkness. Therefore, there's nothing that can ever be greater than that. And so we don't have to experience any time in Hades or darkness because Jesus paid for us to be redeemed from it. And everything about salvation works the same way. We need to know what Jesus has done. We need to believe it and we need to confess it. And then we will receive that benefit. So all we need to do is believe that Jesus paid for our sins, confess him as, as Lord, and then none of these things will happen to us. Amen. Number seven. So seven, eight, nine, we're going to talk about today. Jesus gained all authority in heaven and on earth and took the keys of death and Hades upon so doing. And so previously, he did not have the keys of death and Hades. Previously, the God of this world was holding the keys to death and Hades. And so Jesus has taken those away from him. And being a savior at heart, you know, he is always a savior. And our savior will never leave anyone in prison, but he will save them all. It is prophesied that he will do so. He's already demonstrated that he, he shall, and he will carry that out. Number nine, we'll look again at all these prophecies of Jesus, that he will save all mankind and he will release the prisoners. Then next time we'll talk about number 10 and 11. So Jesus demonstrated that he's going to save all mankind because when he descended, he descended and he was preaching to the evil ones from the days of Noah, the ones who were drowned in the great flood which the devil caused, not Father God. And he went and preached to the disobedient spirits from the days of Noah. And why would he preach? Because he was bringing them salvation and release of the prisoners from the prison house, such that he led captivity captive. They were once captive in Hades, captive to the devil, and he freed the prisoners, and he led those captives 
upstairs to Father God. Amen? Because that's what Jesus does. He's a Savior and He saves. And He is a relentless Savior. He will always save. That is His heart condition. And it will be fulfilled. And it's constantly being fulfilled. Okay, and then number 11 is the icing on the cake is that Leviathan the beast will be saved also. And so if the evil beast is going to be saved, then so much more will all mankind be saved. Okay, then what I may do at the conclusion of all this, I may just take this entire 1 through 11 process flow and attach one or two scriptures to, to each of these and do a summary teaching that maybe it's like 30 minutes or less something short and sweet so that if you want to have a conversation with someone you'll be able to do that and that if they want more in depth then they can go back and watch all the teachings amen okay let's go to number seven jesus gained all authority in heaven and on earth and took the keys of death and hades number one when jesus first came to the earth there was an ungodly one who was ruling and reigning over the earth and had legal authority over mankind and the earth. That one was the devil. Ever since the sin of Adam and Eve, Satan became the god of this world and had legal authority. Although the devil had legal authority over mankind because all men had sinned, the devil had no authority over Jesus because Jesus had no sin. Remember that Jesus said, the ruler of this world is coming for me, but he has nothing in me. The ruler of this world is coming for me, but he has nothing in me. So the nothing that was in Jesus was he had no sin. And therefore the, the devil had no authority whatsoever over Jesus, yet all the rest of mankind uh, did sin, and therefore the devil had authority over all the rest of mankind. And so everything that God does, he does in a legal manner. Okay, so the devil, although, you know, he's, he, he's evil, right? He legally got authority over mankind because he got us to bow the knee to him. And to whomever you bow the knee to, you make that one your Lord. And unfortunately for mankind, we were deceived. We sinned. We bowed the knee to him. And then it's like a legal transaction. Okay, so God, Father God can't just snatch us away from the devil because he had to do things in a legal manner. Otherwise, he would just be a thief, right? And so he had to do things in a legal manner. That's why Jesus came to this earth to wash away our sins with his innocent blood, therefore ransoming us from the God of this world. Amen? And so when your sins are washed away, when you're out from under the law, then the devil has nothing in you. Number two, when Jesus died as an innocent one, his blood paid the price to wash away all sins for all mankind, and he became the legal way out from the devil's authority. Okay, so Jesus' blood washed away all sins for all mankind, and therefore a legal way out from under the devil's authority, it was established. Now Jesus has the right to rule over all flesh because he paid for the sins of all mankind. He has provided redemption from the devil's authority. But we must accept what Jesus has done in order for it to materialize and be effectual in our lives. Okay, so Jesus paid for 100% of all sins. But we need to recognize what he's done and we need to confess Jesus as Lord so that we can bring this into fruition in our lives. Amen? So there is a corresponding action on our part that needs to be done so that this becomes materialized and effective in our lives. Okay, number three. Importantly, following his ransoming works. Okay, remember, everything Jesus did, he came to this earth to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. That's why he came to this earth. Jesus... He became a ransom payment. He became a ransom payment. A ransom is paid to a criminal. We were under the authority of the devil. And Jesus was a ransom payment to a criminal, to the devil. You see, a ransom is paid to an evil person. A ransom is paid to an enemy in order to release prisoners. And Jesus was the ransom payment to release us from Satan's authority. Amen? Jesus loves us. Even when we were still sinners, Jesus loved us, and he suffered all kinds of terrible things to provide a full portfolio of salvation, including redemption from the devil's authority. So Jesus 
was a ransom payment to the devil, a criminal, the ruler of this world, the God of this world. Okay, so let's read this. Importantly, following his ransoming works, Jesus gained all authority in heaven and all authority on earth. Okay, so before Jesus came to the earth, he already had authority in heaven, but he did not have authority on earth. Okay, and so the devil had authority on earth because he had deceived mankind. And let me just tell the story again. Okay, so God created the earth and then he created man and he gave the earth to man. It was our possession. And he said that the heavens belong to him, but the earth he has given to the children of men. So literally the earth belonged to us as if you owned a house and you had the title deed, right? So mankind owned the earth. We had the title deed to the earth. And so when the devil tricked us, we bowed the knee and we made him our authority. We gave him the title deed to our own soul and we gave him the title deed to the earth which we owned. And so we legally gave it to him. And Jesus has legally gotten authority back over mankind by the work that he has done. Okay, and Jesus, he has now conquered death and Hades and has received the keys to death and Hades. And let us remember that Jesus is a savior at heart and he is driven and motivated to save all. And that's the reason why he suffered for us. And Mr. Savior, he will not leave anyone dead or anyone in Hades, but he will do as it is prophesied and he will save all mankind. Amen. Jesus now has the keys to death in Hades, which allows him to release people from these. And that's good news. And Jesus, we thank you and amen. Okay. So Jesus, the Savior, has the keys to death in Hades. Therefore, he is able to release anyone from these. Prior to his work on the cross, prior to his descending and ascending, he did not have the keys to death in Hades. Now he does. He, and the good news for us is he is a savior at heart. He is always bent on saving. His heart condition is to save. And he will, he will always fulfill that mission. Amen? So in Matthew 28, verse 6 and 19, He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so remember they came looking for Jesus after he had been crucified. And the angel said that he's not there, but he is risen. So after Jesus was risen, then... All authority in heaven and all authority on earth belong to him. Okay, prior to this, he had authority in heaven, but not on earth for the, the reasons that we just talked about, how the devil became the God of this world and the ruler over mankind. However, after Jesus descended, after he died and descended and did all the work that he did, now he has all authority in heaven and on earth. So that is good news for mankind. Okay, now we still have a role to play in this. We have to accept what Jesus has done. In Colossians 1, 13 to 14, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Okay, Father God, by way of Jesus, he has delivered us. He has rescued us from the exousia of darkness. The, the Greek word exousia literally means authority. And in some Bible versions, they call it power. In other Bible versions, they call it authority. But this is that legal authority that the devil had over mankind because of sin and because of law. Okay, so the devil had exousia authority. All right, so Father sent Jesus to deliver us, to rescue us from the authority of darkness. Jesus came to rescue us from the authority of the devil and all of his kingdom. And through Jesus, through belief in him, through confessing him as Lord, we are rescued, we are delivered, we are conveyed from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of Christ. Amen? Into the kingdom of God. We are delivered from the kingdom of darkness. We are delivered from the authority of the devil 
and we are brought into the authority of Christ. We are delivered from the kingdom of the devil, and we are brought into the kingdom of Christ. And our redemption, our ransoming, comes by way of Jesus' blood, innocent blood, which washed away our sins, provides forgiveness of sins, and therefore when this happens, the devil has nothing in us. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. So it's very clear here. The devil used to have authority over us, but those of us who have confessed Jesus, we have been rescued from that. Now, be aware that Jesus paid for all sins, so he has the right to rule and reign over all flesh because he paid for all sins. However, some people still need to accept what he has done. The culmination of all things is that all are delivered from the authority of darkness. Okay, Colossians 2, 13 to 15. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped away, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Okay, so we were spiritually dead. Okay, he's speaking to people who are physically alive, but people who are not born again do not have the Spirit of God. And people who do not have the Spirit of God are disconnected from God. They are spiritually dead. Okay, so because of trespasses, because of sin, people are spiritually dead. They are disconnected from God. Okay, and through Jesus, we are made alive together with him. Through Jesus, we are reconciled to God. Amen? Through Jesus, we are reconciled to God. Sins are out of the way. We're out from under the devil's authority, and we are made alive together with him. Okay, and then he tells us how this was brought about. This, this um, freedom from spiritual death, this forgiveness of sins, this being made alive together with him, this is brought about by forgiveness of all trespasses, and that was done by his blood, redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Okay, and having wiped out the handwriting of requirements. That word requirements is dogma. Dogma is the law of Moses. Okay, this is referring to the law of Moses. Having wiped out the dogma that was against us. Okay, the law was against mankind. The law was contrary to mankind. And what did Jesus do with the law? He took the law out of the way. Jesus nailed the law to the cross. Okay, so for the Jewish people, okay, so all mankind throughout all the earth have sinned. Therefore, the devil had authority over all mankind because of sin. The Jewish people or anyone who chose to come under the law were under another layer of authority also because they basically, people under the law, they've signed a contract with the God of this world that they must obey all these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, hundreds of commands, of ordinances, of feasts, of celebrations, of all these sacrifices, all those things they have to do under the law. And if they don't fulfill all of that, if you do not fulfill everything that is written in the book of the law, then you are under curse. Okay, there's no such thing as the Ten Commandments. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of commandments. And there's sacrifices and there's feasts and all of these things. And the scripture is clear. If you read Galatians very carefully, you'll see that if you do not fulfill the book of the law, it doesn't say Ten Commandments. If you do not fulfill the book of the law and everything written in it, then you are under curse. And the curses are terrible. If you go read Deuteronomy 28, you will see that the curses, these are works of evil that the God of this world will bring upon those under the law who do not fulfill the law, all the hundreds and hundreds of requirements of the law. It is an impossibility. Therefore, the devil was constantly bringing curse upon them. Even people not under the law, the devil brings curses and sickness and plagues and evil deeds against them. However, through Jesus, there is a full salvation that gives us deliverance from all of those things if we will choose to believe in that. Okay, but importantly for this teaching, there's two things that Jesus did that were redemptive in getting people out from under the devil's authority. For all mankind, he's provided a way to be forgiven of your sins, and that is the major thing that held the entire earth 
captive under the devil is if you're in your sin, the devil has something in you and he has authority over you. For the people under the law, they had to be redeemed from the law and redeemed from sin. And so therefore Jesus wiped out the law, which was against mankind and contrary to mankind. The law is, the law is an instrument of death. It is an instrument of death and condemnation written and engraved on stones. Okay? It's an instrument of death written and engraved on stones and has the purpose of condemning and bringing forth death. And the law even it multiplies sin. And everything I just said, it's scripture. Okay? So sooner or later, I'm going to do a teaching kind of outlining these things about the law. Okay? But it's clear here. The law was against us, contrary to us. Jesus took it out of the way. He nailed it to the cross. And in washing away our sins and in nailing the law to the cross, Jesus disarmed the principalities and disarmed the powers. In other words, Jesus stripped the devil and all of his kingdom. He stripped them of the legal authority that they held over mankind. Okay, mankind was under the devil's legal authority because of sin. Mankind, especially the Jewish people, were under the devil's authority doubly so because of the law and curse which they signed as a contract okay so when these things are taken out of the way then guess what the devil has been disarmed he's been stripped of his authority amen so that's really good news then in revelations 1 it says i am he who lives and was dead and behold i am alive forevermore amen and i have the keys of hades and of death Okay, now some of you may have seen my teachings on Revelations, and the way I position Revelation is kind of like, it's a lot like the Old Testament. In Revelation, there is truth in Revelation, just like there's truth in the Old Testament. However, a majority of Revelation is also heresy because it's a contradiction to what we know about Jesus from the Gospels and from, and from other passages in the New Testament. And so somebody might say, well, you said that Revelation is heresy. I say that a a good portion of it is. However, there is truth in Revelation, just like there's truth in the Old Testament, yet we also saw that the beast is ruling and reigning in the Old Testament. So there's both truth and there's both evil, okay? And, and this scripture, I'm not taking by itself. I believe this scripture because it agrees with everything else that we just read, okay? It agrees with everything else on this page. So I agree with it. It is truth, it's from the Holy Spirit, and Jesus has the keys of Hades and the keys of death. Remember that back, um, back when Lucifer was being spoken about, it said that he would not release his prisoners from the prison house. And Jesus is specifically prophesied to release the prisoners from prison. And we saw that Hades is that prison of darkness. When people are dead, they are disconnected from God, and they are in a prison called Hades, and it's a prison of darkness. And Jesus is prophesied to release the prisoners from the prison. Therefore, I 100% believe, and it's, and it's fact, that Jesus does have the keys of Hades and of death because he has stripped the devil from his authority, and therefore Jesus is free to release whom he wishes. And he is a savior at heart. And we'll see in the next teaching how he went to save the disobedient spirits from the days of Noah. Now let me just read Isaiah 61.1, which is not on this page, but it's in my notes. And it says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Okay, so it is prophesied that Jesus will open the prison to those who are bound. And we have already seen Hades is the prison, and Jesus must fulfill all prophecy. He must. It is mandatory, and it shall be done. Amen? So this is a fact. Jesus, the good news is that Jesus has the keys of death, and he has the keys of Hades, and he's a Savior at heart, and he relentlessly saves. And the culmination of all things is the salvation of all mankind. Okay, number eight. Jesus is always a Savior. And he will not leave anyone in prison, but will always save. Okay, let's just realize that God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. In James 1.17, it says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, 
with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Okay, so every good thing comes from above, from Father God. And with Father God, and we know that Jesus and Father are one, and we know that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Father. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they they are one in, in will. They are they are one. Okay, they are they are one with one another. Okay? So as the Father is, so is Jesus, so is the Holy Spirit. As Jesus is, so is the Father, so is the Holy Spirit. So you can say that uh, about any of the three. They're all like one and the same. One will, one heart, one mind. Okay? So as the Father, as the Father is, so is Jesus. And with the Father, there's no variation. That means he doesn't change his mind. He doesn't vary. Okay? However he is, he's always that way forevermore. He doesn't vary. There's no shadow of turning. He's constant. He's unchanging. He's perfectly good. He has light, and in him is no darkness at all. He doesn't vary. He doesn't change. He's not wishy-washy. He's not yes for one person, no for another person. You know, God's goodwill is for all mankind, and he's not variable. Okay, and in Hebrews 13, 8, it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is unchanging. And that means the best thing to do is look at Jesus in the Gospels and you will see that he is a relentless Savior. He's always wanting to save. Okay, and and just think about this. The God of the Old Testament, the God of curse, the God of law, the God of curse, he said that he would rejoice to destroy the people. Like in the curses in Deuteronomy 28, and he said, and if you do not obey him, he will rejoice to destroy them. He will rejoice to kill them. He will rejoice to bring curse upon them. The heart of the God of the Old Testament is he rejoices to bring, to bring death and destruction upon people. Yahweh rejoices to bring curses upon people. Now, contrast that. Remember, Jesus and the Father are one, right? However Jesus is, so is the Father. However the Father is, so is Jesus. Okay, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, right? And there's other scriptures. Now, now keep this in mind. Jehovah, Yahweh, rejoices to bring curses upon people. But what did Jesus do? What did Jesus do when he saw Lazarus, um, who was dead? You know, Lazarus was dead. He died of sickness. And the God of the Old Testament claimed responsibility in the curses for all sickness and all death and every evil work. He claimed responsibility for all those things. And if it was Father or Jesus who brought that sickness upon Lazarus, then he wouldn't have been crying. But he was. But Jesus was weeping. When Jesus went to go see Lazarus, he was crying. He was upset. It was not his will that Lazarus get sick and die. That was the will of the devil. That was the will of the God of law and curse from the Old Testament who claim responsibility for every sickness and every disease. Um, that's what Yahweh said. Uh, he, he claimed responsibility for every sickness and disease written in the law and every one that's not even written in the law. He claimed responsibility for 100% of all disease. And Jesus was crying about Lazarus. Okay, then we have Jesus. He's crying over Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you know, he was crying because he knew that this terrible destruction was coming upon them. Remember, he was trying to talk people out of sin. You know, he was trying to, to save them because this terrible destruction of AD 70 was coming upon them and it was going to be a destruction so bad that there would not be one stone left upon another stone. And he was crying for Jerusalem when he was thinking about them. And he says, so many times I wanted to gather you under my wings as a as a hen gathers her chicks. And so Jesus wanted to save them, but they were not willing. And they didn't know the things that made for their peace. So Jesus was crying about curse coming upon Jerusalem, yet Yahweh says that he will rejoice to destroy. Amen? So anyway, so Jesus and Father are not that evil God of law and curse who rejoices to destroy. The heart of Jesus is that he is a savior. The heart of Jesus is that he wants to save everyone. He wanted to save Jerusalem. The heart of Jesus was broken when he had to do things 
so that people wouldn't understand what he was saying, like when he had to speak in parables, so that they, so that the prophecy would be fulfilled. He didn't want to do that. Jesus didn't want to have to fulfill all the prophecies, but he, like he didn't want to have to endure torture and rejection and pain and death and Hades and all those things. But he did it anyway because he wanted to bring salvation to us. Amen. So, just look at Jesus in the gospel, and you will see Father God in him. And you will see that he was constantly healing. He was raising the dead. He was casting out demons. He was protecting people, saving them from storms, saving them from death. He was fulfilling their needs. He was satisfying their hunger. He was constantly doing these physical works of salvation. Okay, well, his works of salvation don't stop with physical, but also spiritual. And we saw that when, when people are in sin, when they still have their sins, then they are cut off from God. They are spiritually dead. And through Jesus, we get the forgiveness of sins. We get the redemption from the authority of the devil and so forth. Okay, so Jesus is a savior. John 3, 16 to 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Okay, so Jesus is a savior. He, he was sent to this earth not to condemn the world, but to save the world. And through belief in Jesus, then we are saved. Okay, so we need to believe in Jesus. Okay, some people will believe in Jesus in this lifetime on planet Earth. Okay, good for us because we're going to have a better life in this present life and then we're never going to taste death. We're going to go straight from this life straight to be with him. Okay, but even people that die, Jesus said, and we already looked at the passages, Jesus said that even the dead will hear him preach the gospel. You know, Jesus he preaches even to the dead. So he exemplified that when he descended. And Peter will see next time that he went to preach to the disobedient spirits from the days of Noah that are in Hades in the prison of darkness. He preached to them. Why? Because seeing they might believe. And I guarantee you, they did believe. And therefore, he led captivity captive. He released the prisoners from the prison house just as is prophesied. Okay, so the heart of Jesus is that he's always a savior. He has authority. He has the keys to death in Hades. And he's going to continue his saving works until the culmination of this physical world is comes to an end or is transformed. Amen? If you don't believe in Jesus, then you are still in your sins and you are still under the devil's authority. Okay, now, Jesus has paid for all sins. So legally, legally Jesus, you know, he's made the payment for all sins. Some people still need to accept what he's done. So whether it's legal or illegal, the devil's still ruling and reigning over people that are in their sins and haven't confessed Christ. And B, condemnation, which is wrath and curse, is from the God of this world. It's from Yahweh, Jehovah, the devil. Wrath and curse are from the God of this world. It's not from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus is the answer to condemnation, to wrath, to curse, and he's never the source of it. Okay, Jesus rescued us from Yahweh. Jesus rescued us from Jehovah. Jesus redeemed the Jewish people out from under Yahweh's law and curse. Amen? So thank you, Jesus, for saving us from sin. Thank you, Jesus, for saving those under the law out from the law. Thank you, Jesus, that you have provided a way for us to be completely redeemed from the devil's authority and from his harmfulness. Thank you, Jesus. And let it be established in each and every one of us that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that you are good and only good. Let it be established in each and every one of us that you are not the author of eternal condemnation, eternal fire, or anything like that that is fiction. Holy Spirit, I ask you to teach every one of us and solidify within us that you are good and only good and lead us into all truth. Let people believe in your goodness. Let people be freed from this idea of an eternal damnation of fire and torture, which is a lie of the devil. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for teaching us and guiding us into all truth. 
Luke 9, 56. Here's the heart of Jesus. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Okay, so think about this passage. So they came into a, a village of the Samaritans. The Samaritans rejected Jesus and his disciples. They said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? And Jesus rebuked them. He turned and he rebuked them and he said, for the son of man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. So that's exactly opposite of the God of the Old Testament. The God of the Old Testament was constantly bringing down fire from heaven. Um, the God of the Old Testament rejoices to destroy, to bring curse, to bring death, to bring destruction. But that's not Jesus. Jesus is a savior at heart. Jesus is a savior at heart. I have not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. So Jesus refuses to destroy. Amen. Jesus cried over Jerusalem when destruction was coming upon them. It wasn't his will for them to be destroyed. It's absolutely opposite of his will. His will is to save. Okay, John 17, 1 to 2. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. Okay, so look at what it says. Jesus has been given authority over all flesh. And it says that Jesus will give eternal life to as many as have been given to him. How many were given to Jesus? All flesh. How many will receive eternal life? All flesh. Amen? All will be saved. Jesus has the keys of death and Hades. When Jesus rose up, he now has all authority in heaven and on earth. He has authority over all flesh. And the culmination of all things is salvation of all and eternal life for all. Amen? Okay, let's go on. So here, I want to read through all of these scriptures again. So we have two pages of scriptures that speak to the salvation of all. We want to ingrain these in ourselves. The, the first thing I want to establish is that prophecy must be fulfilled. All prophecy must be fulfilled. Therefore, keep that in mind. So when we recognize that prophecy must be fulfilled, it's mandatory then we will realize when we read through all these subsequent passages, they must be fulfilled. Okay? So keep that in mind. In Matthew 5, 17 and 18, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Okay? Now, Jesus, um, Jesus, had to fulfill the law in order to okay so let's just think about this in order to in order to save us from sin jesus had to live sinless and he had to bear all the punishment for sin and therefore he became a redeemer from sin by faith in him we are redeemed from sin we are redeemed from the consequence of sin the punishment of sin okay so, but in order to bring that about jesus had to live sinless and he had to bear all the punishment and then therefore he becomes our escape route from, from sin and the condemnations associated with it. Okay, in the same way, Jesus had to be born by a woman. He had to be born under the law so that he could redeem those who were under the law. And that's in Galatians chapter 4. Jesus had to be born under the law so that he was in the law so that he could fulfill the law, so that he could adhere to the law perfectly, and then what? And then Jesus bore all the punishment of the law, um, which is all the curse came upon him, so that, um, so that he could redeem those who were under law and curse. Okay, so he didn't destroy the, the law directly, he had to fulfill it. Just like Jesus had to fulfill the requirements to redeem us from sin, he also had to fulfill the requirements to redeem those under the law from it. And in both cases, he had to live properly, like he had to live sin-free, and he had to live lawfully. And then he had to bear the punishments with both. He had to, to die and be punished for sin, and he had to bear the curse for uh, pertaining to the law. And in doing those things, he has fulfilled the requirements. Amen? Okay, so he, ha he had to fulfill the requirements. Okay, now if we look at Matthew one twenty two, 
So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying, okay, so this is kind of the, the phrase I want you to pay attention to when you read the gospels time and time and time again, it says that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord or through the prophets. Okay. So it's going to say those things repeatedly. So things had to be done mandatorily. The prophecies had to be fulfilled. And there were good things in the prophecies and there were bad things in the prophecies. And here's another example in John 15, 25. But this happened that the word might be fulfilled, which was written in their law. They hated me without a cause. Okay, so what we see when we read the gospel is we see that certain things happened, you know, I guess, spontaneously because something was written in the law. Other things happened because Jesus intentionally had to do them so that what was written in the prophecies would be fulfilled. But, um, but in either case, in both cases, it is mandatory that the prophecies be fulfilled. Okay, it is mandatory. Okay? And these prophecies were written in their law. And while we're here, I just want to point out, Jesus never claimed it as my law. Jesus never said in my law. He, he always referred to it as your law or their law. He never said my law. And there's an important reason why he did that. Because, you know, the law and curse, it's a package deal. The law and curse is not from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus is a redeemer from law and curse. He's not the author of law and curse. Father God is not the author of law and curse. Jesus is the answer to law and curse. Jesus is the redeemer from law and curse. He ransomed the people out from under the law. A ransom is paid to a criminal. Okay, The God of this world ruled and reigned with law and curse, with a spirit of fear. That's how he ruled and reigned, and Jesus is the answer to that. Okay, So notice what he says. In 1525, he said, which is written in their law. In John 8.17, it says, it is also written in your law. In John 10, 34, it says, Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? Okay, so I wanted to point that out while I had this passage from John 15, 25. You know, be aware that Jesus is the redeemer from law and curse. He's not the author of it. It was their law, your law, your law. Amen. Okay, so in verses, in passages 1, 2, and 3 here, we see that it's mandatory that the prophecies be fulfilled. Okay, now if it's mandatory that the prophecies be fulfilled, now let's look at the good news that it's going to bring forth. Isaiah 42, 6 to 7. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. Okay, and we saw in a prior teaching in this series that Hades and Sheol are the prison of darkness that the devil was once in authority over. And Jesus now has the keys to death and Hades and he will bring the prisoners out from the prison. He will bring out those who sit in darkness from the prison house. It must be fulfilled. It's mandatory. Then we have Isaiah 61.1. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Okay, so Jesus came to this earth. It is prophesied that he will bring freedom to the captives. It is prophesied that Jesus will open the prison to those who are bound. It must be fulfilled. Amen. These prophecies must be fulfilled. All man will be saved. Then we have Philippians 2, 9 to 11. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Okay, so every knee, there's a time coming when every knee will bow, people in heaven, angels in heaven even, people on earth, people under the earth, in Hades, in Sheol, in the prison of darkness. And what are they going to do? They're going to bow the knee to Jesus, even those in Hades. They're going to bow the knee to Jesus. All these tongues, they're going to confess Jesus Christ as Lord. And we know from Romans chapter 10, 
what happens when what happens when you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth something about Jesus salvation occurs so when these people see or hear Jesus who are under the earth they're going to be delighted because they're sitting in darkness they're sitting in darkness they have this anguish of soul and here comes Jesus preaching salvation to them and Jesus even said in the gospels that he would he would preach to the dead so that they would have the opportunity for salvation so that they could be judged according to those of the flesh that's what it says that's what he said okay so Jesus goes and he preaches to those in prison he preaches to those in Hades and Sheol and the prison of darkness and when they hear the good news obviously they're in darkness and here he comes speaking this good news they will believe they will bow the knee and they will confess Jesus Christ as Lord. Salvation will occur. He will lead the captives out of captivity. The prophecies will be fulfilled of him bringing liberty to the captives. The prophecy will be fulfilled of him opening the prison and setting them free. And all of this is to the glory of God the Father, whose heart is to save all mankind and rescue us from everything that the devil messed up. Um, save us from all the oppression of the devil. Save us from all the works of the devil. Save us from the prison. Amen. Then we have 1 Timothy 4.10, For to this end we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. Okay, so notice it says that God is the Savior of all men. Okay, some people will believe in this lifetime. So it says, especially of those who believe. So those of us who believe in this lifetime, we will have many more benefits are made available through us to us through faith. We will have the opportunity to be healed and to walk in health. We have the opportunity to be healed not only physically, but also emotionally and mentally. We have protection as available, protection of God, preservation from all harm, victory in life, a long life, satisfying life, love, joy, peace. There's a long list of benefits to people who believe in this lifetime through faith. Okay, But, but God is the Savior of all men. Some will be saved in this lifetime, in this physical life on earth. Some will enter into Hades and um, be under the earth. But even they will hear the gospel and they shall be saved because all men will be saved. Then we have Romans 5, 18 to 19. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Okay, so first of all, just re recall from earlier in the book of Romans, in th verse 323, it says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So in verse 19, when it says many were made sinners, it's actually all. So Romans 323, all have sinned. Okay, so now let's just look at this again. It says, through one man's offense, through Adam's sin, judgment, death, condemnation, it came to all men. Okay, so Adam messed everything up for all men. Okay, and Adam was the first Adam. Jesus is the last Adam. So Adam, the first Adam, was a type of him who was to come. And the type is this. The first Adam, through his sin, ruined things for all mankind after him. Adam messed things up for all men who followed from him. All the breakage that the first Adam brought forth, Jesus fixes it. Okay, so through Adam's sin, through Adam's offense, judgment came to all men. Through Jesus' work, salvation comes to all men. Through Adam's offense, judgment, condemnation, and death came to all men. Okay, so Adam was one person who messed it up for all men. Jesus was one person who fixes it for all men. Amen? Jesus will 100% fix everything that Adam broke. Jesus will 100% fix everything that the devil broke through Adam. Amen? And if Jesus can't fix what the devil and Adam broke, then the devil and Adam are greater than Jesus. And that's not the case. Amen? Okay, now one more thing I have in my notes here. I want to read Isaiah 14, 12 to 17. It says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, 
you who weakened the nations, who made the world as a wilderness and destroyed its cities, who did not open the house of his prisoners. Okay, so I just wanted to say that again. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 17. It's, this is talking about Lucifer, the devil. It says, who did not open the house of his prisoners. Okay, so I just want to reinforce this idea of prison and Hades and Sheol. It's all one and the same. And I want to reinforce that the God of this world was holding prisoner people after death. He was ruling over them in their lifetime upon the earth. And then after death, he was holding them in his house, in the prison house, in Hades, in Sheol. And so therefore, Jesus is going to set the prisoners free. He's going to bring the prisoners out from the prison. He's going to bring them, bring those who sit in darkness out from the prison house. He's going to bring freedom to the captives. He's going to open the prison to those who are bound. And again, this is another reinforcing point about Jesus having the keys to death in Hades. A key opens. He will open the prison. Amen? Now let's go on. Number nine, Luke chapter two, verse 10 to 11. Then the angel said to them, do not be afraid for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. Okay, so Jesus is a savior to all mankind. John 442. Then they said to the woman, now we believe not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Okay, He is the Savior of the world, all of the world. Some in this lifetime, some after death. And John 12, 32, And if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. Okay, He will draw all people to himself. For what? For salvation. Acts 3, 21, whom heaven must receive until the restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Okay, so all things will be restored. All people, all, all things will be restored. All means all. All will be saved. Even the devil will be saved. And you can see that in, in the book of Isaiah where the beast will be saved. Romans 11.32 For God has committed them all to disobedience, that he might have mercy on all. All shall receive mercy. All shall receive salvation. All shall receive eternal life. And again, remember, remember what it says right here in John 17. It says that Father God has given Jesus authority over all flesh and that Jesus will give eternal life to as many as Father God has given him. How many did Father God give? All flesh. How many will Jesus give eternal life to? All flesh. All men will be saved. He will have mercy on all. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Okay, the same all that died because of Adam, that same group, which is all mankind, that same group of people, they shall be made alive. They shall have the eternal life. Amen? Ephesians 1, 10. That in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth in him. Okay, so there's a fullness of time that's coming and everything will be brought together. All, all things will be restored. All things will be reconciled. All things will be brought together in Christ, which means there's a salvation of all mankind. Number 16, Colossians 1, 19 to 20. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Okay, how many things are going to be reconciled? All things. All people will be reconciled. All people will be restored. All people will be saved. There will be mercy on all. All shall be made alive. All will be gathered in Christ, and on and on and on. Okay, so Jesus Christ is the Savior of all mankind. Some in this lifetime, some after they have died. But the culmination of all things is the salvation of all, kind, of all mankind. And again, remember, the maximum penalty that anyone could ever experience if they reject what Jesus has done is they would bear the consequence of their sin, which is three days in Hades and darkness. And you can go back and watch that in, in the last teaching. Okay, 
So all men will be saved. Next time, we're going to see that Jesus, he demonstrated the salvation of all when he went downstairs and he preached to the disobedient spirits from the days of Noah. We'll look at Leviathan the beast being saved, and then we'll talk about um, some next steps after this. So God bless you, and we'll talk again soon.